Hello, my name is Rick Weinzerl, and I'm a professor and extension specialist in entomology in the Department of Crop Sciences at the University of Illinois. This session in our beginning farmer training program, Preparing a New Generation of Illinois Fruit and Vegetable Farmers, provides an introduction to pesticides and pesticide application. My objectives for this discussion are to help you learn or better understand the different categories of pesticides and different ways to classify or understand them, how pesticides are applied, ways to minimize adverse effects of pesticide use, and the regulation of pesticide use. This introduction to pesticides is not a substitute for attending a pesticide applicator training program offered by the Illinois Pesticide Safety Education Program. Later in this presentation, I'll provide more information about training and licensing for pesticide applicators. I'm going to provide an overview of the major categories of pesticides from several perspectives. I'll discuss formulations, modes of action, resistance management, residual versus knockdown pesticides, systemic pesticides, and selective versus non-selective pesticides. I'll provide links that provide recommendations for the use of pesticides in fruits and vegetables and talk a little about pesticide application. I'll also provide some basics on ways to minimize the use of and adverse effects of pesticides, practicing integrated pest management and pesticide resistance management, avoiding environmental contamination and non-target impacts, and protecting human health by following label directions and restrictions, including REIs, re-entry intervals before working without protective clothing in treated fields, and PHIs, pre-harvest intervals that must elapse between the last application of a pesticide and the harvest of the treated crop. The United States Environmental Protection Agency and the Illinois Department of Agriculture both have important roles in the regulation of pesticide use in Illinois. Recognizing the distinction between general use and restricted use pesticides is very important, and that will lead into explanation of the licensing of pesticide applicators. Although certain details of pesticide applicator training differ among states, the general ideas will be relevant to all fruit and vegetable growers. We name pesticides according to what we intend to kill or control with them. Insecticides for insect control, fungicides for control of plant pathogenic fungi, herbicides for weed control, and several other icides are all pesticides, and all are regulated under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act and its amendments. It's important to realize that we use many substances to kill unwanted organisms, not just insects and weeds in crops, but bacteria in swimming pools, in bathrooms, and on kitchen counters. We name them for their intended purpose, but many may be toxic at some level to other organisms, either immediately or over the course of repeated chronic exposures at low doses. Developing and using pesticides with minimal adverse effects on non-target organisms is an ongoing goal for manufacturers, users, and consumers. The active ingredients in pesticides, either synthetic or naturally derived, are almost never sold in pure form. They are mixed with carriers that make them easier to mix with water in a spray tank or spread more evenly as a dust. The pesticide product that you purchase is called the formulated product or the pesticide formulation. The formulations on the left are dry products, dusts, powders, and granules. Dusts and some granules are applied as dry material. The other formulations are mixed with water. Constant agitation in a spray tank is required for the products that do not dissolve. Numbers represent the percent active ingredient by weight in the formulated product. 7,5-D is a 5% dust for application in dry form. Brigade 10-WP is a 10% wettable powder 
that is mixed with water to form a suspension that is applied through a sprayer. The formulations on the right are sold in liquid form, emulsifiable or liquid or soluble concentrates that are also diluted in water before application. In general, for liquid products, the numbers that are part of the label represent the number of pounds of active ingredient per gallon of formulated liquid product. Brigade 2EC contains two pounds of the active ingredient bifenthrin per gallon of product. Pesticides are identified by three types of names. The chemical name that describes the molecular structure of the active ingredient, the common name used to identify that active ingredient, and the trade name used on the formulated product. One naphthol carbamate is carbaryl, and seven is the original trade name given to products that contain this active ingredient. You can see the chemical name of azadiractin and one of its common formulations. Azadiractin is neem, and the formulation listed is nemix. The reason to point out these technicalities is that a single active ingredient may be sold under many trade names. The identity of the active ingredient in a pesticide product may not be apparent based just on the trade name on the label. The label for this formulation of bifenthrin, a pyrethroid insecticide, lists the common and chemical name of the active ingredient. Brigade 2EC contains two pounds of bifenthrin per gallon. It's a restricted use pesticide, something we'll discuss in more detail shortly. Other parts of the label also show that this is a group three insecticide for insecticide resistance management. And those other parts also provide specific instructions on crops that can be treated, allowable rates, restrictions, and so on. Let's very briefly summarize some general characteristics of insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides. For each group, modes of action describe in general terms the main way that the pesticide interferes with normal biological functions in target and sometimes non-target organisms. Most insecticides interfere with nerve impulse transmission in animals. Several interfere with the action of neurotransmitters such as acetylcholinesterase or with sodium channel ion exchange along nerve axons. They are used with relative safety to humans and other mammals because our exposures are very low in comparison with those encountered by insects, and our ability to detoxify the doses we encounter prevents the primary toxic effects from occurring. Over the last few decades, several insecticides have been developed that rely on modes of action other than the inhibition of nerve impulse transmission. Some are microbial insecticides, that contain pathogens that infect and kill only certain groups of insects. Some interfere with growth or molting hormones in insects, and others disrupt insect mating behavior. All labels for pesticides, insecticides now, require IRAC numbers that describe the mode of action of the insecticide. IRAC stands for Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. Where alternating or rotating among different insecticides over time is recommended to slow the development of resistance in insect populations, it is important to use insecticides in different mode of action groups, not just products with different names or active ingredients that may work in the same way. For fungicides, FRAC codes, mode of action codes identified and assigned by the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee, recognize 12 broad modes of action. Where multiple applications of a fungicide are needed over time, rotating among products with different FRAC codes is recommended. A few older fungicides, such as Captan, have multiple modes of action, and even after decades of use, resistance remains rare for most fungal pathogens. Fungicides are also described as protectants versus eradicants. Protectant fungicides must be on the surface of the plant to prevent fungal entry and infection. 
They do not cure even very early stages of infection. A few fungicides are able to kill fungi after very early stages of plant infection have already occurred. These are called eradicants, and they may be described as having some kickback activity. Be aware, however, that their eradicant or curative value is only for very early stages of infection in most cases. Similarly, herbicides used to kill weeds are grouped according to their modes of action and assigned HRAC codes by the Herbicide Resistance Action Committee. Over a dozen modes of action are recognized, and using herbicides with different modes of action is recommended to slow the development of herbicide resistance in weeds. Widespread use of Roundup, or glyphosate, in corn and soybean production, without rotations involving other weed control practices, is widely cited as the reason for the evolution of glyphosate-resistant weeds. Many herbicides that are effective for weed control in specific vegetable crops may be difficult to incorporate into small-scale mixed crop vegetable production systems because they persist in or on soil and can injure subsequent crops, or because different crops are planted in close proximity to one another and drift from sprayed plants to nearby plants may be an issue. We will return to more detailed discussion of the use of pesticides and other practices for insect, weed, and disease control over the next few months, but the basics on insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides should make those discussions more relevant and understandable. For most pesticides, in addition to knowing the mode of action of the ingredients, how long the product lasts and whether or not it moves within a plant or animal is key in understanding how to and not to use it effectively. Although there are exceptions, in most cases we want a pesticide residue to persist on a plant for at least a few days. And in fact, residues of many insecticides are effective on plant surfaces for five to seven days. We also do not want excessive residues to remain on harvested produce, persist in soil, or move into water. So rates and timings of applications are regulated accordingly. Systemic pesticides move in the vascular system of plants and in the circulatory system of, system of animals for a few pet and livestock insecticides. Most common is movement from roots to stems and leaves, as is the case with the insecticide imidacloprid or admire. The herbicide Roundup or glyphosate moves from leaves to roots. Labels and instructions for the use of pesticides note whether or not they are systemic. Some pesticides are broadly toxic to many organisms, and others are more selective or specific. This is evident when one reads the label on a pesticide. It often states specifically which insects or weeds or plant diseases it controls or prevents. Most Bt insecticides kill only caterpillars that eat them. Many new reduced-risk insecticides are effective against only certain orders or groups of insects and some microbial insecticides that contain insect pathogenic viruses kill only the larval stages of a single genus or species. These examples of selectivity differ phenomenally from the broad spectrum nature of the old organochlorine, organophosphate, and carbamate insecticides. For herbicides, many pre-plant, pre-emergence, and post-emergence herbicides are selective. They may kill grasses, but not broadleaf weeds, or vice versa. Other herbicides, such as paraquat or glyphosate, are non-selective and kill most plant species. A very few pesticides, especially fumigants, are highly toxic to a very broad range of organisms at their common rates of use. Methyl bromide and other space or commodity fumigants are in this category. So how do you identify what pesticides can be used in what crops to control or prevent specific pest problems? For tree fruits, the annually revised Midwest Tree Fruit Spray Guide and the Cornell Guide for Organic Apple Production 
lists spray recommendations for insect, plant disease, weed, and vertebrate pest control. For grapes and small fruits, such as brambles, blueberries, and strawberries, the annually revised Midwest Small Fruit and Grape Spray Guide and the Cornell Organic Production Guides for certain small fruits provide spray recommendations for specific pests. For vegetable crops, the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide and Cornell's Organic Vegetable Production Guides for specific crops provide pesticide recommendations and other production and pest management guidelines. We cover integrated pest management in an upcoming lecture and discussion, but it's important to note now as well that spray guides list a wide range of pest problems, not all of which occur in any given field. They provide extensive listings of approved pesticides for crop and pest combinations. They do not cover all the production practices that might limit or avoid pest problems. That's not their purpose. Other references do cover cropping system design, monitoring, scouting, and other aspects of crop and pest management. Use the spray guides to understand what pesticides can be used effectively where they are needed, but don't use them exclusively as the basis for your pest management programs. Production guides and spray guides provide very useful summaries but the pesticide label is the ultimate legal document for how a pesticide may be used. Labels list target pests that the product controls, but these are sometimes a bit too inclusive, and checking recommendations in spray guides may lead to the most effective products for specific pests. Labels list the rate, usually per acre, that can be used and the maximum number of applications that can be made. Never exceed these limits. Labels may instruct against application to blooming crops or weeds to prevent bee poisoning. They may restrict applications in areas where water contamination may be especially likely. And they always caution against application if winds exceed speeds that are likely to cause drift. Labels specify the pre-harvest interval, the number of days that must elapse between a pesticide application and harvest, and the re-entry interval, the time period that must elapse between application and the return of workers to the treated field or crop unless they are wearing protective equipment and clothing. Pesticide users also must comply with worker protection regulations regarding signage at treated fields, training employees, and the provision of personal protective equipment. Let's look at how pesticides are actually used in fruit and vegetable production. Pesticides may be applied to the soil with the intent that they persist for several days at the location where they were applied so that they prevent crop damage from insects or prevent weed growth. Soil applied pesticides are usually, but not always, incorporated or mixed at least lightly with the soil. Some are applied just in bands for example, a width of seven inches or so that covers the row as corn is planted, but the area between the rows is not treated. Insecticides applied to the soil for residual control of insect pests typically have soil half-lives of 30 to 90 days, much shorter than the old residual organochlorine insecticides of the 1960s and 70s. Typically, they are very low in water solubility, so they do not leach into groundwater. Not every insecticide that is effective when applied to foliage is effective when used in the soil, because many break down very rapidly in the soil, or are bound very tightly to soil particles, and therefore unavailable to enter and kill soil insect pests. Examples of the use of soil residual insecticides include applications around foundations of homes to prevent infestations of subterranean termites, and the use of soil insecticides in a band over the row to control corn rootworm larvae in cornfields. Soil applications of insecticides are sometimes used for seed and root maggot, grub, and wireworm control in vegetables. Where protecting seeds from insects or fungal pathogens is necessary, Growers may buy treated seed 
or in a few instances apply treatments onto seeds after purchase. Most residual insecticides and fungicides used in this way are not systemic. They do not move upwards via the vascular system to above ground portions of plants. In comparison with band or broadcast applications of insecticides to soil, seed treatments use far less insecticide on a per acre basis. Consequently, seed treatments are preferred over band or broadcast applications if the seed treatments effectively control the target pests. Seeds that have been treated commercially with an insecticide or a fungicide are always coated with a dye as well to indicate that the seed should not be used as feed. So you never feed colored seeds to animals. Pesticides may also be applied to soil or seed not primarily to protect the seed but to allow for the movement of the pesticide in the vascular system to protect above ground parts of plants. Applications to soil can be made prior to planting, at planting, or post-emergence as a drench or via irrigation. And that all depends on specific product labels. For soil or seed applied systemic insecticides, above ground control of insects begins a few days ap after application and lasts for two to three weeks. Many of the insecticides used in this way are neonicotinoids that are highly toxic to bees. This prevents a serious hazard where high rates of long-lasting insecticides are used around landscape, trees, or shrubs for several months of control of leaf-feeding insects and where treated seeds are used on vast acreages of corn and soybeans. Another group of soil pesticides are fumigants and methyl bromide has been the most common of the soil fumigants. It is injected into the soil and the surface is immediately covered with plastic to slow its escape. It moves in the gaseous form in the soil and kills a wide range of soil organisms. It dissipates slowly over a few days, then crops are planted through the tarp or mulch. Soil fumigation is very expensive and not used commonly in Illinois. Methyl bromide has been identified as a gas that contributes to ozone depletion in the atmosphere and alternatives to it are under development as plans to phase it out are eventually carried out. These are examples of soil fumigation and crops grown on fumigated beds. In the case of the picture at the bottom, those beds were fumigated, allowed to sit, and then later a water wheel or other device was used to poke holes where the plants would be placed and then transplants are placed after the fumigant has dissipated from the bed below. Herbicides applied prior to planting in some fruit and vegetable crops include non-selective herbicides such as Paraquat or Gramoxone and Roundup. Roundup is systemic and moves in the vascular system to the roots and kills most plants to which it's applied Gramoxone or Paraquat kills the tissue it contacts, often killing the above ground portion of the plants. It is not systemic, however, and plants that can regrow from roots or crowns will grow back after treatment. Some selective herbicides that kill some kinds of plants but not others are applied to the soil surface prior to planting or after vegetable seeds are planted but before they have emerged so that the herbicide kills germinating weed seeds and small emerged weeds. Atrazine is among the herbicides used in this way in corn. For many small growers with diverse cropping systems, drift to nearby areas with susceptible crops and residual activity of these kinds of herbicides in future crop rotations provides challenges that often prevent their safe use. Post-emergence herbicides applied within crop fields after the crop is standing may be selective, for example killing broadleaf weeds in a grass crop such as sweet corn, or they may be non-selective but applied to a resistant crop, such as with Roundup use in Roundup Ready corn and soybeans. Roundup and Paraquat, both non-selective herbicides, 
also are used in perennial fruit crops, but they are applied at a time and in a manner where they do not contact green tissue or damage the crop. Among the most common pesticides applied to fruits and vegetables are sprays of insecticides and fungicides to the above ground portions of the plant to protect foliage or fruit from insect feeding or pathogen infection. Most of these sprays are intended to provide lasting control for a few days. Some, however, have little or no residual value after application. These include knockdown insecticides. Either they work only while still in the liquid form, or wet, or their chemical residues, though they would be effective, break down so rapidly that they do not continue to kill insects for very long. Natural pyrethrins are very short-lived. Malathion also breaks down rapidly enough that its pest control value does not last more than a couple of days in most outdoor uses. Short-lived products are usually the ones that can be used very close to harvest in fruits and vegetables. In some instances, short PHIs are granted for products that are very low in toxicity to humans who will eat the fruits and vegetables. But in general, a short pre-harvest interval does not mean that a pesticide poses low risk to the applicator. So always be careful. Most insecticides and fungicides applied to crops last from 3 to 10 days as effective residues on treated parts of the plants. Rainfall of over an inch removes residues and activity, and time and sunlight also allow degradation. Most insecticides used in plants are contact poisons to insects. The chemical residues rub onto the insect's cuticle, move through the waxy layers, and enter the insect via this path. Most do not have to be eaten to enter the insect and kill it. Pesticides may be applied by boom sprayers, airplane mounted sprayers, air blast sprayers, and platform mounted sprayers, and by many other types as well. Where plant foliage presents a dense canopy and makes it difficult to push an insecticide or other pesticide into the center of the plant with just spray tank pressure, Fans that move the air with the pesticide provide improved coverage. Both conventional farms and organic farms will have the need for sprayers on a variety of scales. Backpack, hand pump, electric, and gas-powered sprayers are the entry-level setups for many growers. Though low cost, they are not effective for applying products evenly over larger areas. 15 to 30 gallon small tank sprayers powered by a 12 volt battery can be mounted on four wheelers or utility vehicles and small pull behind or three point hitch mounted boom sprayers uh, may be appropriate for larger acreages of low growing vegetable crops. For growers with a few acres of sweet corn, a high boy sprayer that can pass through rows even when corn is four to six feet tall is usually a necessary investment. For orchards and vineyards, an air blast sprayer, either a pull behind or a three point hitch mounted model, becomes a necessity as plants become large enough that spray penetration into the plant canopy requires air as an additional carrier. It's difficult and time consuming to treat lots of trees effectively with a hand sprayer and applicator exposure is also a concern. Many fungicides are labeled for use on fruits and vegetables, and other disease prevention chemicals such as copper and sulfur compounds may be used primarily as bactericides. Some have limited curative or kickback activity and may be called eradicants, and as I said earlier, most are protectants that prevent infections but do not stop or kill existing infections. Even more than insecticides, very thorough coverage of plant tissues is necessary for protectant fungicides to be effective. Fungal spores do not crawl around on leaves and encounter spotty residues, as insects might do. Some insecticides and fungicides applied to foliage are at least somewhat systemic. Movento applied to apples will move down the vascular system to trunks and roots and kill woolly apple aphid. 
Fontellus is locally systemic in apples and some additional crops as well. It's used for scab control in apples. Finally, it's important to distinguish between pesticides that move as tiny liquid particles in the air, called aerosols, and pesticides that move as gases in the air, called fumigants. Fine aerosol sprays, like those produced by pressurized bug bombs, float through the air and land on exposed surfaces, including cuticles of insects. They may be used for fly control in packing houses or cider rooms, but they are not fumigants. They do not penetrate closed spaces, such as kitchen cabinets, drawers, and so on. These are all examples of aerosol application of fine droplets that contain pesticides. The aerosol floats through the air to reach many exposed surfaces. I hope the X through the illustration in the lower right is for obvious reasons. No protective clothing or equipment to keep the pesticide off her skin, out of her eyes, or prevent her from inhaling it. No pesticide is safe enough to use in this fashion. Fumigants, in addition to those used in soil fumigation, may be used to disinfest stored grains, flour mills, and ripe fruits and vegetables. Common fumigants include methyl bromide, phosphine, chloropicrin, sulfuryl fluoride, and even carbon dioxide. Fumigants are highly toxic, and applicators must be specifically licensed to use them. Gas detection and measuring devices and self-contained breathing units are commonly required. So this is far different than the usual pesticide application to foliage or soil. Uh, realized fumigants are particularly dangerous. They do not represent other pesticides in their hazard, but they do have to be handled appropriately for the very few people who will use them. So, Pesticides, be they synthetic or natural products, can be toxic to a range of non-target organisms. And they have to be handled appropriately if adverse effects are to be minimized. Protecting pollinators, natural enemies, fish, wildlife, and humans is always a concern. Non-target effects can result from direct application, drift, runoff, leaching, and residues on foods. Too frequent applications favor evolution of resistance in pest species. So what are the logical steps to reduce risk while still preventing excessive losses to pests? The most common approach to minimizing risks from pest management activities is to use integrated pest management or IPM methods. IPM is based on the use of a range of practices that limit losses to pests while minimizing environmental damage, human health risks, and dollar costs associated with pest suppression. Tactics include biological control, cultural controls, pest-resistant varieties, regulatory programs, and pesticides where needed and in ways that minimize their adverse effects. I urge you to plan and design farming systems that minimize the likelihood of severe pest problems. Steps will include crop rotation, cover crops, plant diversity, tillage, pruning, thinning, ideal planting and harvesting dates, using resistant varieties, managing irrigation well, and several other steps. IPM then involves monitoring crops to assess the densities of pest and beneficial organisms, or scouting and then using pesticides if needed. The least disruptive pesticides may be synthetic or they may be of natural origin, though synthetic products cannot be used in certified organic production. Simple rules govern pesticide use. After designing a farm plan that reduces the likelihood of pest problems, spray only when needed, based on results of scouting efforts. Spray only in areas where pest pressure requires it. Rotate within types of pesticides according to modes of action to slow evolution of resistance. And never apply a pesticide in ways prohibited by the labels. Especially, do not use more than a label allows or instructs. 
do not apply pesticides in excessive winds or too close to neighboring property or sensitive crops. Manage soil erosion and do not apply pesticides to waterways or field borders. Where labels restrict use to protect shallow water supplies, always obey the label. And do not apply pesticides in ways that will poison bees or other pollinators. We will discuss these recommendations in more detail when we cover insect disease and weed management. One thing that owners of sensitive crops and livestock can do to notify pesticide applicators of their vulnerability to drift is to register their locations on Driftwatch. The Driftwatch Specialty Crop Site Registry is a voluntary communication tool that enables crop producers, beekeepers, and pesticide applicators to work together to protect specialty crops and apiaries. It's not a substitute for any state regulatory requirements. Applicators can, however, get advanced integration capabilities to help avoid spraying specialty sites and receive notification when sites are moved or added to the Driftwatch database. Producers have an additional layer of protection against accidental pesticide drift when they use Driftwatch. The locations indicated on this slide are orchards, greenhouses, high tunnels, cucurbit fields, tomatoes, and other vegetables. Clearly, there were more such properties in business than were registered at the time this screenshot was taken. So Driftwatch is sometimes still underused, and I encourage you to use it always. Symbols on this map indicated the locations of apiaries and beehives. And again, although many are shown, there are probably more that need to be registered. Pesticide users, products that are approved for organic use and those that are not, should all be aware that pesticides can harm humans. Applicators, consumers of treated food, everyone who lives in the environment. So using pesticides strictly according to label instructions minimizes risks where pesticides must be used. Labels indicate what crops may be treated, how much may be used, when a crop may be treated, and what precautions should be taken to protect applicators and workers who will later enter treated fields. Pesticide labels are not like brownie recipes. The details are not optional. If a little works well, using a lot is not a better choice. Not spraying and not using the maximum allowed rate are available choices. Spraying too often or using too much are not available choices. Failure to follow label instructions that protect the environment, workers, and consumers is punishable by law. Pesticides are regulated by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and in Illinois by the Illinois Department of Agriculture. The U.S. EPA requires data on the environmental fate of pesticides and their toxicity to a range of test animals. It uses these data to construct the details on the pesticide labels. Some states require additional data, primarily New York and California, though usually they use existing data but may develop more restrictive labels. The Illinois Department of Agriculture charges a fee to each company that registers pesticides for sale in the state and for each pesticide they register. That fee pays for regulatory expenses and pesticide safety, safety education programs and the state's applicator licensing program. All registered pesticides are classified as general use or restricted use products. General use products may be purchased by anyone without proof of knowledge or training, but their labels are still the law in terms of how they may be used. Restricted use pesticides may be sold only to licensed applicators who have passed a licensing exam. Products available to homeowners and others at garden centers and hardware stores are exclusively general use products. But the labels on these products may state not for commercial use. This means that produce treated with these pesticides should not be sold. So commercial growers should purchase and use products intended for on-farm use. 
Illinois classifies pesticide applicators as private versus commercial. For fruit and vegetable and small-scale livestock producers, the term private applicator can generally be translated to mean farmer applicator, someone who uses the pesticide on his or her, or her own property for the production of their crops and livestock, or as exchange labor with another farmer. Commercial applicators apply pesticides for hire, and their licenses much, must match the type of for hire application they are going to do. For example, field crop, rights of way, turf, landscape plans, and so on. Operators are workers who are employed by a company where an applicator with greater training supervises their work. So this is the two-tier idea of operator and applicator. Again, for students in this beginning farmer's class, a private applicator's license is the category of license needed to purchase restricted use pesticides for application on your farm. For information on educational programs and testing required to obtain a pesticide applicator's license, check the Illinois Pesticide Safety Education Program website. Dates for training and testing are listed there. Even if you do not plan to obtain a pesticide applicator's license, taking the training offered in these programs is a good idea for all growers. Training sessions include information on safe handling, calibration, application methods, and much more. So that's our brief summary of pesticides. As an introduction, we will talk much more about various kinds of pesticides in conjunction with insect, disease, weed, and wildlife management in fruits and vegetable crops. Pesticides are often necessary in fruit and vegetable production. Using them responsibly and effectively can protect crops from losses and protect your profits. Using them incorrectly or irresponsibly can cost money, fail to protect crops, and present risks to others. Be sure to use accurate resources and make decisions on pesticide use and crop protection very carefully. That's it for this session, and we'll continue on with additional pest management topics in additional presentations.